Today we're at Netherdale, home of Gala Rugby Club, and this weekend they launch a new initiative called Marooned at Gala. Well, welcome to Borders Rugby in Focus and as usual delighted to have Dale Clancy here to look at what happened at last week's Borders Festival of Rugby organised by Hoyk Rugby Club and chew over the news of the week plus of course uh, previewing the new initiative from Gala Rugby Club Marooned at Gala with President Ian Dalgleish and also one of the greatest players to have come out of the club, Mark Moncrief. We'll also be meeting up with the new president of the Border League, Jim Harrell, the head coach of Gala, Fraser Thompson, and another well-known man in these parts, Richie Gray. But let's start with you, Dale, and last weekend another festival of rugby at all levels down at Hoyk, and another triumph in terms of exposing some very good rugby players who will uh, no doubt go on to entertain us this season. Yeah, I, th I think, again, following on from uh, Peebles' effort the, the week before, it was it was great to see a, a lot of good competitive action back in, uh, you know, at, especially at Mansfield Park, it's such a, a you know, in terms of the borders, it's such a historic ground, and I think the level of, of competition, the, the standard, the skill set was just a little step up from what we've seen at Peebles. I think, you know, the, the, the players are starting to get a little bit more accustomed to, to what they've missed over the last you know, 18, 19 months, and you know, we've seen a better performance from Melrose and Jed. A really, really good final. Me and Graham Hogg both said that off air as well, as well as on the coverage, how, how competitive it was, and it was a, a proper Borders final. But you know, good to see a couple of players. Kieran Clark played really, really well. I thought David Colvin. I think he was perhaps unlucky not to get play of the tournament. I thought he was exceptional. You know, and on the Jed side as well, Mason Cullen uh, showed up well in, in the stages and the time that he got on the pitch. Uh, but the young brothers as well. You know, the youngs just showing what they what they can still do. So really good, really well organised again. And obviously the junior tournaments as well. Peebles going really, really well in the under 16s, and, and Selkirk winning a, a really good final against Gala as well. Well, we turn to Mark just now. By the way, we must say something about the wind. When we started, it was as calm, <laughs> and now a hurricane has uh, blown up under under us. But uh, hopefully, that will die down a little bit later. But let's go to Mark Moncrief. Now, you're involved with coaching uh, the youngsters here at the moment, and uh, your lad involved. Nairn's involved, yes. I mean, um, the coaches you find historically at the mini section uh, normally join because of their sons or daughters. So John Balmer and I in particular have followed our sons since P2, so that's about 10, 11 years ago. So we've just kind of followed up through the, the stages and the years with them, which has been very enjoyable to see them all develop, not just their sons, but the group as a whole. And it's obviously as well nice to see the, the new generation coming through. Obviously we've got Townsend's boys, Gregor Townsend's boys, doing really, really well at the moment, Luke and, uh, and Christian. And uh, and also, you know, further down the road, Tony Stanger's got relatives playing as well at Hoyk, so it's uh, it's all good to see. But we must mention the under-16s, Peebles, uh, 222 points for, zero against in six ties. Have you ever known anything like that? Uh, not in recent times, no. I mean, I, I know Neil well that coaches them up there. Again, we followed Neil and that squad right up through the, the various years, and they've just got a, a real depth of players and quality players. And when you have quality players and you've got depth, it creates competition. So they're all vying for those 10, 12 positions every week. So Neil's headache is actually try to keep all these players players happy whereas a lot of the clubs uh, locally they're lucky if we can get the 12 15 players down so it's a lovely headache for them to have but um, they've got really nice runners balanced and about four or five of them when they get away they're away so um, other teams maybe have one or two but no I don't envy them it's a it's a good old squad up there and you've got some good boys at Gala Red Triangle as well. We definitely do. Um, and the joy for me is over the years that you see them developing and now they're turning into really young young men. So physically they're they're competing better. Um, the lads that were maybe two or three years ago weren't competing. All of a sudden um, they're there. They've got the, the body there to do it. It's just trying to keep them training hard and uh, just willing them on to compete. Um, but we try to create that environment at Gala. And again, the Maroon Day I think is a perfect example of what the club are trying to achieve. by getting everybody in the town involved and uh, for one I'm very excited about the weekend. Absolutely well let's bring in uh, Ian Dalgleish then the president of uh, Gala Rugby Club and uh, Ian I mean the good thing here now is that you have everything under one roof effectively. <coughs> yes uh, that uh, really happened over a period of lockdown as much as anything else and we're uh, really happy that everything is under one roof from minis right the way through to senior rugby. It's something we've been striving to achieve for a long time and uh, it's great to see such a good performance from the Triangle and the Wands at uh, 
at the tournament and both reaching the final in Hoyk, unfortunately not getting the actual trophy, but at least they both got to the final, so that's good progress. It's certainly very promising for the, the rest of the season. Yes, indeed. absolutely. Yeah. And there is this clear pathway now, isn't there, right the way through so, to the senior level? Yes. Aye. Which does make a, make a differ- difference. And I must mention Bill Noble as well, who's been, what, Gal Academy about 40 years or so, and, and his influence as well in the town is, is just phenomenal. Yes. Uh, we're very happy to have Bill as director of rugby, and he's, he's got a very clear vision of what he wants to do in terms of developing players coming through. So that's a, that's a good uh, base to work from. Great stuff. Well, we'll be hearing more from you all later when we talk about Marooned at Gala. But uh, before the season kicked off, I caught up with Gala head coach, and that is Fraser Thompson. Yeah, I think I think last year, obviously, we started up in about May time um, and we trained, obviously, that was our long, we had a bit longer piece of blocks in between and, and we trained really hard and then they, we thought we were going to be at August and then it got put back to October and then again it got put back to December. But to be fair and credit to all the guys, they trained right through till Christmas and obviously when we knew there was going to be new rugby, we started doing some more fun things. But the guys used it as an interaction as well because they weren't allowed to do much else apart from their work and stuff like that. So, And a lot of our guys are local, as you probably know. So the buy-in for the guys has been really, really great. And then at that point, as a management, we kind of decided that, look, we need to give them all a long break because, look, we've worked hard and... They've worked hard for really no reward. So we decided to give them the first first four months of the year off and then we just very, very gradually brought them back in, like nothing rugby straight away again, like some different things and different activities that they were able to do at that time with the restrictions. And then gradually through May and June and July and it, we managed to introduce more and more rugby and now we're pretty much full steam ahead for our, our pre-season now. So. And uh, how about yourself on, in the coaching role now, of course, where we're all used to seeing you on the pitch as well. Are, are you playing days over? Or, yeah, or are yeah, you doing playing, a bit more? playing days are over. Um, <laughs> I think the guys are maybe hoping that I'll, I'll play a bit. Yeah, unless there was a mass COVID outbreak, um, <laughs> I think the playing days are over. So, no, I look, at, coaching was always something I was interested in. And yeah. uh, I was lucky enough with Melrose and the Southern Knights laterally in my career, like I was able to have input whilst I was playing into some of the the coaching kind of things with with Bob Christie and stuff like that but uh, like the chance to be able to be a head coach straight off the bat and nothing else but at your, where you're actually your home club like Melrose is probably my club that I played on the rugby but your actual home club where, you, where I played here initially it's a chance I couldn't have turned down and then uh, my assistant coach at the moment Fish, best, uh, you and he's my best man so there's that rapport there already so yeah it was a great opportunity and to try and build something like me and Fish, you and whatever you want to call them, I'll call them fish, that's probably easier. Um, <laughs> you and Dodds, of yeah, course. Yeah, <laughs> you and Dodds, of course, that's right. But we have a vision that we want Gala to be the most successful club team in Scotland and we want to get them back to that, back to where we believe they belong. Um, and like when you look at the history and the surroundings and everything like that, like the club's steeped in it. So we've got a, a real uh, strong belief that we start to build that and it might not be straight away, it might take a few years, but if we can put things in place, then that'll hopefully come into fruition. And it needs the, the guys themselves to buy into that history. And I'm sure they do here at Gallup. Yeah, absolutely. And as I said, because they're all local, like they all know the guys and obviously our coaching team as well. Like the club's now all under one roof. So like the the Mini Maroons, the Triangle, the uh, Wanderers, even the Vixens, they're all under the Gala Rugby Umbrella, which is a massive piece of work that Bill undertook during COVID and he managed to get that over the line. And that's made a massive difference as well. We've now got really good coaches right through. Like we've got Mark McCreef, who you've just seen. We've got... Alan uh, Johnston and Tom Weir at the under 18s and there's loads of coaches right through that gives us a great a great base and a great structure to develop players from ground up and then we want a conveyor belt of players coming through Netherdale so that when they come off the back pitches and they come to senior rugby they're aspiring to be here and then they want to play here and then if they push on to be further that's brilliant we've done our job because it's our job to develop players as we can. And of course, you know, very important to go among the schools, the Gala Academy as well, which is a rich source of uh, talent, no doubt, and get them involved at an early age. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the thing is, we we want to be able, like, obviously, you look at the football across the road, just across the fence there, it's it's really busy all the time, and they've got a great setup there, and we can have the same here, we just have to work at it. And again, local players, local school kids, and then they come down here, and they've got their under 15s, under 16s, under 18s, first, second, third year at the school, so... It's again uh, bringing all that through and keeping, hopefully there's not too much drop-off. Obviously people go to university now, but if we can have something here that is really uh, 
aspiring to be in and they want to be involved and they're more likely to come back, whether it's from Edinburgh during the week or then after the university degree come back or if we can get people back here, that's the big thing. Fraser Thompson there and uh, clearly he wants to see this club back at the top table once again and that's certainly echoed by everyone at the club, isn't it, Ian? Correct. Confident about the season? We can see the, the difference in terms of uh, what Fraser and Bill have brought to the club and and you and Dodds, of course, who's been with the club a long time. And, uh, yeah, there, we haven't really got a lot of additional players in, but uh, they're def definitely gelling well together. And uh, it looks very promising at the moment. And we'll just have to hope that it turns out on the field. Do you like the direction that the club's going with this all-inclusive uh, setup? Very much so. I have to say, in my early career, when I started in '86 at Gala, um, there was a number of us were always up vying for the club to come under the one umbrella, and for various reasons, which we really don't have to go into. It never really happened. So when I did get back involved, I was delighted to see, it, as I said earlier, it coming under that one roof. It just makes life a bit easier for all. One committee, um, the one direction, continuity, the progress for players from the bottom up, top down. Um, we had good chats with Ian Fraser, Ewan, there's John Amos an ex-Gala player, all putting some sterling work in uh, at the top end and they're actually offering their services to the minis and to the triangle and to the wands, which again is something I would just encourage any club if you've got the top end buying into the, the junior sections, it just enthuses the young players to come through because we can't forget these young under 16s or minis, they're looking at their gala players or their people senior players, they're their heroes. And if they see them mixing in with them, it absolutely picks them up no end. So, no, um, I think you can tell already from my point of view, I'm absolutely delighted with the direction the club's going. And people like you and Dodds, Fish, as he's known down here, of course, and uh, uh, again, someone who gives so much to the youngsters as well, and on the pitch as well. I mean, he's going to be another key figure this year. He definitely is. I mean, Fish is just one of these players, he just just, um, commands a lot of respect and he got that basically through performance and I think that's what's good about the rugby, you get the respect by doing the performances on the pitch and over the years uh, Fish has done that consistently um, and Fraser again with his past, I mean he's been a top level player for many years um, so again having these boys at the helm is definitely helping push the club and encouraging the senior young players that are going about as well. Now, Dale, what about you from a, an outsider's point of view, looking in from your Peebles perspective, your ivory tower over there, <laughs> having a look at Gala, how, what do you see here? Um, Gala's over the time period where I've probably been doing the, the commentary and, and, you know, seen a lot of the, the various various games in the borders. Gala's been a team that I think have frustrated me because I think they've got such a big, huge setup here. And I remember when, when I was playing age grade, players like Fish and Fraz, they were the players I was playing with and against in district stuff and, you know, at school rugby and they're they're great, they were great, great players and it's so refreshing to see young players want to, you know, take on these responsibility roles at a club and I know from my point of view, when I was younger, I was looking up at the players who were, you know, the senior players in the in the people's team wanting to be one of them and it is, it's, it's really refreshing to see that they're going under the one umbrella because I, I remember having a, the conversations with people from Hoyk and I, I, the, the, the situation at Hoyk's completely different but they would, you know, they would be a, a huge, huge team if they could just all work together but, you know, they've got different, they've got dif different opinions and different ways that they're working too. Um, so it's great to see that, that Gala have got a focus, they've got a direction, streamlining stuff so that, you know, players, because they've got to serve their community, that's what it's about. Clubs need to serve their members, their players, their supporters, their sponsors and it's great that, that Gal are, are, are looking to try and do that the best way possible which is making sure that rugby is accessible for everybody, it's easy to play, it's easy to get yourself involved in the club and there's nothing else really that you want from a, from a club other than that in your community. Now we'll be looking forward very shortly, but let's do one quick look back. And that was uh, the Southern Knights, of course, scoring uh, three tries to stay unbeaten last week against Ayrshire Bulls. 22-20 at the uh, Green Yards. Jacob Henry again getting a try and looking very useful on the wing. But that's that's a good start to the season for the Knights under Rob Christie. Two wins and a draw. Yeah, definitely sitting, you know, second in the table. Uh, just a point behind, I believe, in the, the Super Six table. And that's the first game at home. So, you know, a good, a really good positive start to the season. As we've said in last week's show, 
they kind of went up and down in their first kind of season of Super 6 and I think they've really you know, hit the ground running this year um, maybe probably still in a march in some of the other teams but certainly welcoming the Ayrshire Bulls we've seen when it was the, the club when it was the, the two club teams you know we've seen loads of battles between Melrose and Ayr over the last decade um, so that is a you know a top end game in Super 6 so for the Southern Knights to get the victory is a, a huge positive for them it boosts confidence with wins because comes more wins and certainly they'll be looking to build on that well, let's bring in another of our gala guests today, a man who takes some tracking down, I can tell you, former captain and coach Richie Gray, well-known globetrotter and inventor, and a man who will be heading to France shortly, as he told me when I spoke with him yesterday. Well, Richie, you're normally seen all over the world. You've been to South Africa, you've been to France, all the rest of it. We'll come to what you're up to at the moment uh, very, very shortly. But we're here at Netherdale, a place that you know and love very, very well. You've got a great history here yourself. What are your, what are your best memories? His best memories are here. I think, uh, well, it all started here and it continues here for me. In some ways, and I say this a lot around the town, that I wish I could do more with my club, but you're, you're that busy and you're away and travelling and I'm involved, obviously, in a number of different things. So, you know, I'm sure I'll come back to the club at some time uh, in, the, in the future and maybe have more of a kind of hands-on. But at the moment, obviously, your job dictates where you go and where you travel to. So it's always great to get back down here, though, and it's like a... It's always a good anchor for me, you know, the minute I've been in rugby fields and changing rooms and venues all over the planet, but it's always great just coming through the gates and coming back to your own club, you know. And it all started with your dad? Yeah, my father, exactly, yeah. M my father was actually the first coach that Gala ever had, because it used to always be captain coach the club, and then they decided to get a coach, so my father was the first ever coach at Gala, uh, played over 300 games for the, for the town. And then obviously was the first director of rugby when we started having directors of rugby and things like that as well. So the whole family's been incredibly linked to the club uh, for many, many years and, and hopefully for many years to continue. So it was a bit inevitable, really, that you were going to play for them? Yeah, it was. I think, uh, I suppose there wasn't much else to do in Gala. In the good old days, there was just like football, rugby, hockey. That was it. So you kind of made your, your choice. But yeah, I was always, I was down here. I would think I'd have been down here when I was in a pram, you know, quite easily because my father was still playing and then coaching and I've just pretty much spent most of my life in and around this pitch or on the back pitches, you know, right through the age grade and involved in many rugby and then right through the senior stuff and then obviously captaining the club at the end, which was obviously a great, uh, always a great honour and, you know, we had some great times, especially in that last two or three years where we you know, managed to go and win border leagues and Scottish Cups and we had a really good side, good group of players, a uh, huge amount of gala guys in there as well, which was great, so, no, all good. That must have been your proudest moment, I suppose, lifting the cup at Murrayfield. Yeah, it's a great moment. It was uh, It was a great moment for the town. You know, I always, I always think back to that whole sort of year where, you know, don't get me wrong, we had a good side. I'd love that team to have actually had a crack at uh, Premier 1 because, remember, we were a Premier 2 team. So we won that league, uh, and it was pretty much always going to be between us and Kelso. Huge rivalry kind of built up over that couple of years. And then we just went on this sort of run of, you know, semi-finals and, and then on to the final up at Murrayfield. And I think always winning something first is always great. You know, you always want to be the team that, that won it first, which, which was great. And it was a great group of players as well, you know, players that had been together for many, many years and would not won a lot, you know, we'd always sort of battled away and then to come through in that last two or three years was great so and it just made it for the town then the the, the sevens team went on to have a phenomenal uh you know run in the sevens as well winning melrose and a number of others so it was a it was a great season something you'll always look back on and i think whenever you mention it you know in the town especially there's always a sort of smile on the face uh all the good memories and there was a huge crowd there wasn't there I think, Stuart, there was about 26 or 28,000 at Murrayfield. It was the biggest crowd they ever had. And I think, obviously, that was helped by, I think most of the finals were contested by border teams. I can remember Selkirk being there, Jed were there, I think Duns were there. It was a huge sort of borders day out. And, uh, yeah, it was a great atmosphere. And uh, just uh, great memories and great to look back on. But when you were playing here... Surely you wouldn't have even imagined beyond your wildest dreams that you would be at the World Cup with the Springboks coaching them and winning a medal. I suppose, all, you know, there's a great saying that the harder you work, the luckier you get. It's a great saying and, you know, there's a lot of people, not just myself, but others that have been involved in me, have put in a 
lot of time, you know, especially the whole law side of things. Because uh, whatever you do in my sort of world, when you're creating equipment and whatever, you have to have it covered well by by law. Uh, so yeah, it's been really interesting. South Africa, Montpellier, and then back to Scotland for a couple of years. America with the NFL, uh, and obviously now Fiji up until the World Cup. Uh, and then you're now with Lyon in, in the top 14 in France. Yeah, so. that's, that's pretty hot news, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's really only come about, although it was incredibly difficult uh, after, you know, the three years at Montpellier and then COVID kicked in. That was really it. You know, the whole the sport sort of ground a halt for a year. So there was not much you could do. But as I've said before, it was maybe quite a good year just to take stock of where you were and what you were going to do. But I've always, you know, liked the way Lyon play. Uh, they're a sort of no-frills club, uh, very french oriented. obviously you think, well of course they are because they're in the French top 14, but number of French players in and around their system in there, there's not a huge amount of foreign players, uh, Pierre Mignone, the ex-scrum half uh, who played for Clermont, Toulon, uh, is coaching there, so I've always had a link to them and it was great when they asked if I'd kind of assist with them this year, so I'll be consulting to them, but down there about 10 days a month. Down in uh, down in the top fourteen, a league that I've always enjoyed coaching in, uh, and I think it's only going to get stronger that league, especially what they've done with, you know, making sure that there's a big number of French players within it, uh, and some of the best players in the world are all coming to that league. So, good place to be. And how is your French? It's not too bad. Yeah, I can <laughs> I can get away with coaching in it now. Uh -huh. uh, you know, obviously the three years at Montpellier helped. Socially, maybe not the greatest, but then you know, you're maybe not greatest socially anyway. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, I can I can get away with coaching what I need to coach in it, and I'll I'll just keep learning and just getting better. You know. Richie Gray, a man who's managed to cram 25 hours into a 24-hour day with all his activities. And uh, Mark, you know him very, very well, don't you? Yeah, he's a some very, man. He is. He's some cookies. He say try to track him down. And we've got a friendship group of about 10 years that get together for the, the couple of Indians every um, every year. But Rich is always somewhere in the world. And as you say, it's down to me to try and track him down. But he always comes back to us eventually, comes back to Gala. So that's always good for everybody. Well, in that interview, I was asking him about his memories of Gala as well, and you've got a few yourself. Oh, I mean, if I look back, my career at Gala spanned from 1986 to 96, and um, predominantly for me, I was fortunate to be playing alongside, when I first started, Derek White, Peter Dodds, to name two internationalists at the time. So as a young 17-year-old coming into a, a very strong uh, Gala park and whatnot, it was just an absolute joy. So as, as I look upon it as an apprenticeship, so I was 11 stones soaking wet with a full dinner in me. <laughs> Uh, so you can imagine coming out to play against internationalists, but um, these boys really have helped us through greatly. And alongside me was John Amos, who was the same age, Mike Dodds. So we were all kind of baptised at the same time and eventually matured into reasonable players at, at the gala setup. And something you mentioned there, playing with internationalists, and that's something, unfortunately, it doesn't happen nowadays. Yeah, I mean, I get caught now. I always said when I was a younger man that I would never reminisce, and I find myself over 50 <laughs> continually <laughs> reminiscing now. And it pains me sometimes, but I'm, I'm, I'm a man that always looks forward. There is no point looking back. It won't change back to how it was. So we've got to look forward. But if there's one thing I thought was, was great back in the day was you were playing week in, week out with internationalists, and they definitely helped. And there was one... One in particular, if I recall, um, playing against Ivan Tukolo, and he scored two tries on my wing up against Selkirk. And after it, we're in that bar that we're looking at just now. I was away to buy my lager shandy at the bar, and I got a tap on the shoulder, and I turned round. It was Ivan, and he says, "You got 20 minutes." Aye, and he just ran through the, the two or three things that I did wrong, and I was in absolute awe of this guy because he was an internationalist. But he just he, he don't get access to that now. So these are the things that we enjoyed back then, but I'm very aware it, it won't it won't go back to how it was. Having said that, Mark, yes. we we do know that Gordy Reid is joining Mar, which is fantastic, and there are rumours that Jim Hamilton is going back into club rugby uh, <laughs> as well. <laughs> Goodness I, me! I don't know if that's a rumour or not, but we'll stick that one out there and we'll see what happens. But that's nice when they do come back. But usually, because they're playing at such intensity at high levels now, coming back to the club game, they're actually knackered. Indeed, I mean, when you speak to Richie Gray, as he maybe alludes to when you, in the interview, um, these guys now are conditioned for the big hits I mean when I look at the game now I'm like I shudder I just think I'd be in their pockets half the game and I'd be passing the ball willingly to my opposite number but I mean they're, they're big physical chaps they're eating all the right 
foods, um, they get the right recovery, it's all individual stuff now. Back in the day, everybody was told to eat pasta and bananas, everybody ate pasta and bananas. It's avocados, it's steaks, it's poached eggs, and but it's all done to the individual, which is brilliant, and definitely what the game needed, but there's some big animals out there these days. They certainly are, that's for sure. Now, I've always said that you're the unluckiest player never <laughs> to win a cap for Scotland because you played for Scotland on tour and stuff like that yep. several times indeed but no cap no cap I'm one of about 34 players in Scotland that had the good fortune to play for Scotland and it was in the days when if there was three or four senior players a mess or resting before a Lions tour or even just taking a break from a, a regular tour they deemed those games uncapped so yeah I sit in that category um, so, but you know what uh, I saw the world of rugby and it molded me into the guy I'm now, which I'd like to think is reasonable, um, <laughs> but I mean, the rugby for me, the friendships you gain throughout the years, I mean, yeah, we could bore each other tonight with stories, but there's there's guys I've not seen for 20 years, you walk into a bar and you just take off where you left off for 20 years ago, and I'm a great believer that camaraderie is not experienced in many sports at all. Well, I know you've come to terms with it now, but at the time, uh, that must have bugged you a wee bit, yeah? Well, strangely, it didn't really bug me at the time because in the World Cup situation in particular, I was one of 26 and I was the only one not to sit on the bench or play. But when you're in that sort of bubble, um, all I cared about was the success of the team, would you believe? And I was a raw 22-year-old, so this was new to me. Um, the whole setup, it was a wonderful experience. It wasn't until I got back to Gala, to my parents and relations, they said they were devastated for me. And I was like, what? And then it kind of sunk in. Aye. But you know what? I, I wouldn't change it for anything. It's, that's just how it goes. Ian, let's look forward then, shall we? Yes. Marooned at Gala. Now, they had a false start. It was supposed to be last year. Obviously, we know what happened. <laughs> but you've got it again now. And uh, this is an extra one. This isn't part of the Kings of the Sevens. But you've decided we're going to have another Marooned at Gala when it's properly... You, I think you take the Hoyt date now, don't you, in, in April after Melbourne? Correct. Um, but this one is a, a bit of a one-off, a bit of a trial, if you like. It's a new initiative from the club. Tell us more. We'd done a lot of planning going back a couple of years, so we had a very good idea of what we wanted to do. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm very pleased with what we've got to so far. It's been a, a huge amount of work. It's uh, clearly quite a big risk. We're very fortunate here. We've got a set-up, not just in uh, Netherdale, but the whole area, where that's what started the discussion off, really, that we could do all of it in one day. As you've already said, we've had festivals of rugby and hoik and peebles, which have been over three, two or three days. Well, you know, we're compressing it all into one. And to keep people engaged, we've, uh, we've got live, live music starting at 12 o'clock, finishing at 9. Uh, we've got street food out on Nether Road. We've got some fun fairs and an inflatable assault course and uh, stuff like that for, you know, just uh, for a bit of fun for the kids. But it's all about engaging with the community. I mean, your neighbours across the road, Gallifrey Dean Rovers, they're involved yes. as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It was. It's always been planned as a community event, and we we felt that our own sevens were one because of the timing of them, and two. Uh, I have to say that I think if you want to get the community involved, you've got to provide more than rugby now, because there are too many distractions. So you've got to get something else to hold them. Now, what you hope is that when they come here and they have the distractions, but they'll be watching some rugby as well, and that will spin off and uh, help to grow rugby in the town, because that's really what we're ultimately all about. If we don't get back to being a really strong club with a growth all the way through from primary school, then you know that's what we need, and that's what rugby needs. But the, the investment in the community by doing this is something that hopefully you, you think is going to pay off. Yes, and uh, we want to establish it as an event every year and uh, build on what we do this year. Now, just finally, on this subject, parking, what happens? Because I was driving to Netherdale just now and there's, like, no parking signs everywhere. What's the situation there? Uh, well, we've got a free bus running from uh, Curry Road. In the, in the, well, it's actually running from... Uh, from the interchange but it's going via Curry Road car park so you will be able to park there and get the bus although Curry Road's not a long walk from here if the weather's okay. So basically you're saying walk to the ground it's, a, it's only a mile away from the town centre or exactly. just hop on the bus. Hop on the bus or hop on the bus to go you know and hop on the bus to go back.
Well, let's put you all on the spot now. We did this at Hoyt. We did it at Peebles <laughs> as well. We're going to go through the draw, and I want a name from you. Who's going to be getting out of these four pools? Let's start with Pool A and Gala, Peebles, and two Scots Barbarians, Dale. Well, I've been slated by Ross Brown for slagging Peebles for the last two weeks, so <laughs> in a bit of sarcasm, I'm going to say Peebles, because nobody else will. <laughs> well, let's find out. Ian, <laughs> uh, well, I wonder who you'll be going for. Well, I think that's going to be Gala, unfortunately. Yeah. Don't be unfortunate. Fortunately, for you. Fortunately yeah. yes, I was going to say. Yeah. And uh, Mark, it's got to be Gala out that group. Yes, I think so. Let's go to Pool B. We'll start with you, Mark. We've got uh, Selkirk, who will be appearing this week. It's uh, good, good to hear they will be sending a team after. Obviously, a uh, couple of the uh, the squad uh, tested positive last week. They had to miss the Hoik tournament, which was a shame. But they will be back, and they'll be taking their place in Pool B along with Edinburgh Ackies and uh, two Scots SA. I'm going to go Borders again, I'll go for Selkirk. Selkirk for that one, who yep. looked very good at Peebles. Ian? Yeah, I'll probably agree with Mark. Selkirk seems like a good bet for that one. A good bet, and yep. uh, Dale? I, I'll, I'll go with Selkirk for that one. Um, I think you don't know who the Asai are going to are going to bring. You know, they're, they're an army team, so they could be great, or they could be the upper end of this the spectrum. And Edinburgh is look pretty poor at Hoyk, so I think Selkirk, even with a couple of COVID cases, they should be able to put together a good team. Yes, because of course last week um, there was just one playoff. Effectively, Selkirk withdrew at the at the last minute, so it was a Kelso Edinburgh Ackies uh, shootout for the five points. Effectively, and uh, Kelso won that, and uh, they were uh, delighted with their performance. But you had people like you know Ben Appleson and Richard Mill in the Edinburgh Ackies side. Yeah, Richard Mill's a great um, seventh player, and he has been for a few years playing for Edinburgh Ackies and for for Melrose. But you know, I just think that they did look a little bit. You know, whether they've got 15s games, they just looked a little bit unorganised and disjointed. And Kelso have got, you know, they played Percy Park, they've played at Peebles, they were playing at Hoyk, so they've had a bit of sevens under their belt and, and no doubt they'd have been doing some training. I know clubs are focused on 15s, but yeah, the Edinburgh did look a bit poor, but they'll probably now go through from that pool. OK, <laughs> on to Pool C then, and it's Kelso, Watsonians and Hoyk. Dale. Kelso. Kelso, OK. That was a one-word answer. <laughs> Ian? Yeah, that's going to be a pretty competitive pool, I think. I think I'll opt for Hoyk. Opt for Hoyk, and uh, I wonder if we'll get Watsonians from Mark. Well, just to be different, <laughs> <laughs> I'll go, which isn't like me, I'll go out with the boards and see Watsonians. That's the maroon connection, clearly, indeed, there. Yeah, indeed. there. And of course, it's a completely different Watsonians <coughs> to the ones that we've been used to. Obviously, a lot of their players are now playing uh, for the Watsonian Super Six side, and uh, and there's a lot of youngsters coming through, learning the trade. But of course, never forget the Mike Kerr, Andrew Kerr connection. Indeed, and I mean, all the Edinburgh sides, or even the teams out with the borders, the, the most successful team has been Watsonians and they have served up over the last two decades some wonderful um, attractive sevens play so uh, I've not seen the current crop here because I'm involved obviously with the youth but I'm, I'm hearing that they're, they're just as good or as competitive. Excellent and finally on to Pool D which is Jed Forrest, Boromir and Melrose. <laughs> Mm, um, and of course we should bear in mind that there's a lot of 15s games going on as well over the weekend because we're only a couple of weeks away from 15s so there will be different uh, teams particularly as it's not part of the Kings of the Seven so we have to bear that in mind too Yeah, I'll go on Melrose's recent success last week so uh, the other week so I'll, I'll take Melrose for that pool OK, on to Ian uh, good, good question <laughs> I think uh, <coughs> I might just go out the borders for that and uh, plump for Barramuir, actually. OK, and Dale? I'll go Jed. Um, <laughs> I think they were they were good in the final, and I think that they, they'll, they'll want a little bit of retribution against Melrose. That'll be the tie of that, I would say, the tie of that pool. So, um, yeah, I think Jed are starting to improve. They improved drastically from Peebles to to Hoyk, and I'd, I'd expect them to go another step up. They were, they were yeah. pretty impressive. There is, of course, another Sevens event happening, and this is on Friday. Normally, it's, uh, I think, Tuesday uh, out at Kelso. It's um, the John Lang Sevens, which is basically for the, the B teams. Melrose Storm against Jed Forest A, Hoyk Force against Galloway M, Kelso Sharks against Peebles, and Earlston against Selkirk A. But it's a straight knockout, eight teams, and it's going to be quite exciting. Yeah, I've, I've, I've never played in it, but I know it's, you know, it's good to see that there is a you know a tournament an accessible tournament out with like first team uh, rugby for you know some of the reserve players some of the more um, you know up and coming players that maybe can't make the team or some of the older players who are trying to mentor or some of just the social players who are probably good at sevens but they just can't commit the time so it'll, it'll certainly be it's good to see that that's back up and running anyway um, because obviously that's been missing for the last few years with everything going on so nice to see that kind of squeezed in the calendar as well
Well, our final guest on the programme today is the man who's uh, the new president of the Border League, and that is Jim Harold. Extremely honoured to have been appointed president of what is the oldest competitive uh, league in world rugby. Um, we say that and obviously we're, we're very proud of that in the borders, but I think it's important that uh, it, it's made relevant to where we are in the 21st century. And this is the important thing, isn't it? Because over the past few years, it's been increasingly difficult to uh, to get the Border League up and running in a way that we all want, simply because of fixture congestion. It is. And you know, every club's priority will be uh, their national competition. Uh, and also we have the, the National Cup to factor in. And then probably Kings of the Sevens in terms of the income it generates for the clubs. So the Border League does tend to get left behind a bit. Um, however, it's something that we're, we're looking at, um, we'll try and prove it. The first thing really is to make sure that the clubs fulfil the fixtures as they stand. And that's not always easy? It's not. Um, we've had problems in the past. Um, one of the things that does help is where you can double up in a league game. Um, to my mind, that, that's not always great because you're looking for additional revenue, you're looking, for, you're looking to play teams that you might not get to play otherwise in the season. Uh, so we are fortunate enough to be playing Melrose and Kelso this year that we wouldn't otherwise get to play. Um, that will increase revenue for whoever's playing at home. Um, the rest of them will be able to, to double up in their league games, which will help fulfil those fixtures. In recent times, of course, it's been the pool system four in one and three in the other. Yes. Um, and that seems to me to be the only real logical um, way of doing it at the moment. It is. Um, one alternative might be to have a straightforward knockout competition, um, which would help fulfil the fixtures. Um, you know, there would be fewer games and it would be a simpler path to the final. However, I'm not sure if there's an appetite for that at the moment. Uh, involves change and there's not always an appetite for change within the border league. In the borders though there is that balance of the tradition which we all fight to keep and as you say moving forward at the same time. Yes, um, you mentioned the phrase I've been which is um, uh, always seems to pop up. Um, we need to change, we need to move on um, otherwise basically we'll end up uh, with these fixtures not been fulfilled and the border league will just fall by the wayside. We've got some fantastic uh, product there in the Kings of the Sevens in particular and I think we can do a lot more with the border league as well uh, in terms of bringing in sponsorship, making it more relevant. We just have to get the structure right and you know, changing the constitution and the structure of the league itself will be hopefully the first step in doing that. So it's a difficult task for anyone, and you're obviously right in the middle now as the, as the president. Uh, obviously, it's something you're you're looking forward to and, and enjoying the challenge, but um, you're obviously under no illusions that it's going to be a little bit difficult. I think um, if you look at Borders Towns, they are uh, the streets of the Borders Towns are, are littered with uh, the tattered and torn bodies of past presidents who've tried <laughs> to effect change in the in the Border League. Um, I can't see me by it being any different, but I will do my best um, to try and, and uh, make some changes, take things forward and uh, modernise things. Like I say, you know, inroads have already been made to that in the, in the last 12 months. We've got some great guys in the league, um, Norman Anderson, Stuart Kinghorn, who put in a power of work, um, try to take things forward. And it's, to me, one of the, the most important things, and Jim Curry will, will tell you this as well, it's improving the decision-making process. We have uh, two representatives from every club come to every meeting. Not all of those representatives have a mandate to make a decision. So if someone raises something for discussion, it's discussed on the night, um, no decisions generally taken, it goes back to the clubs, they discuss it at their committee, it then comes back for further discussion, um, and no decisions guaranteed at that point either. So I've got a few ideas in mind by, way, by which we can shortcut that and uh, hopefully streamline that, streamline that decision-making process. But we have to be realistic. Um, the, the clubs that are playing rugby in the borders uh, are governed by the SRU. The SRU are governed by World Rugby. Um, so we, we're limited in terms of the decisions we can make until decisions have been made at Murrayfield. 
um, and you know, and with the, the national leagues as well, you have a, a premiership committee and a national one committee. Um, until they decide what they're going to do, uh, we're kind of left picking up the pieces um, until these decisions have been made, and we can then go on and uh, uh, make a decision based on what's left. Well, Dale, a difficult job being president of the Border League. So many different opinions amongst clubs, different agendas. But Jim's a good guy. He's uh, well respected in the Borders rugby community from his time at Selkirk. And I think he'll do well. Yeah, I'm sure he will do well. Um, Jim Curry said it was quite easy, <laughs> uh, actually. But the, yeah, it's 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 great. Borders, the, the Border League, the, the oldest league in the world. So it's good to see it still, you know, continuing after what's been difficult. Some things have fallen by the wayside, but... Again, the border border rugby comes through, and, and the border league's still going strong. So, you know, I wish them all the best in that. I know they're they're trying to obviously try to get a little bit more influence up in Murrayfield, um, trying a new structure as well. So they'll be looking to see some see, see some changes in in border rugby over the next few few years. Jim's obviously taken over. See how how he gets on in the in the chair. The border league though does need to change. It's uh, I won't. It, there are definitely. You know, rugby has changed and I think to a lot of respects Border League hasn't kept up with the changes and there, as Dale referred to, there is a, a new constitution which is going to be launched sometime and some changes to the structure of the Border League as a result of that, assuming it's approved and uh, I think those changes will certainly help to make the Border League more effective because it, I think it has lacked some effectiveness. Uh, and the Border League tournament itself, it's been pools for the last few years and it's had its critics as well, obviously. I mean, it's, I mean, we've seen Gala and Melrose both get to the final with one game and things like that. But what do you do? Because, you know, it's a packed fixture list. Well, that is, that is the big problem. I think the, uh, there is a, an approval in place for it with the SRU to change all the leagues to 10 leagues. But that's been delayed because of COVID and changes to the the league structures but that is going to happen in the next uh, couple of years and that will create a little bit of space in the uh, timetable so perhaps there can be more border league games if that happens but at the moment the only way you can fit them in is this uh, pool system and of course seven doesn't go equally so you end up with three in one pool and four in another <laughs> yes it's not easy is it being no. on the border league i have to say but uh, everyone's obviously trying to do their best for the, the the borders and mark as a player you've played in some spectacular border league matches in your time yeah i mean the border league historically has been fantastic and i tap into everything that dale and ian are saying it's like everything we talked about earlier local clubs are having to change their perspective and how they approach the community um, I don't know enough about the Border League and uh, what goes on at these meetings but for me it's to lose any parochialism all the clubs have to buy in it's just what we're saying, the clubs in Gala have all come under the one roof, need some unity and just a bit injection the upbeat, positive, what can we do to make this more attractive for the crowds, for the players and the players will thrive under that um, and it's up to these men on these committees to come up with the right ideas to, to make it enthusiastic and um, attractive. And a lot more young people possibly coming up. Yeah, well, we're saying there's like Fish and Fraze are doing the coaching now at Gal at the senior team, and I'm sure there's other clubs are under the same. So, again, it's trying to get the younger generation at all levels, whether it's at the mini section, whether it's at the section I'm in, um, senior committees. And I think um, Ian would agree we've got Sinclair Patterson's on the committee at Gala, who's injected a good bit of young life, and he's a bit quite a bit younger than me. So, again, it's fresh ideas, and what people have to be open to is constructive criticism. I think some people get so defensive. Yeah. And it's like if you come up with something and it gets voted through, everybody has to buy into that. And I just find or hear that um, a few take objection to it and then the knives are out. So for me, I'm one of these guys, if somebody phoned me for a bigger and they wanted a hand with a player, I would go to bigger. If it was Peebles and it was a winger, I'd go to Peebles. So I think we, we're all one as the South. I think sometimes we get caught up still a little bit too much in our own little uh, worlds and our towns. So uh, just buy into the big picture would be my words of advice. Indeed, indeed. And of course, I would say, on the other side, when the clubs do come together, like organising the south of Scotland and stuff like that, my goodness, it works well. 
it, it always has. I mean, um, I'll go back many years of Tuesday night playing Linlethley down at Hoyk on a Tuesday night, absolutely pouring rain. 7,000 people came to watch it. It was just the year before it went the pro, and it never really recovered, in my opinion, for then. But let's not go into the depths of the, <laughs> the past. We, we need to go forward. Absolutely. That's the message from today's programme. We've got to move forward, forward, which is yes. what we'll do. Yep. 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 Well, that's just about it for today. My thanks, obviously, to Mark and Ian and Dale here for their contributions, and also to Jim Harold, Fraser Thompson and uh, Richie Gray. Next week we'll be visiting Dunn's Rugby Club and I hope that you'll join us then.